begin. I'm Shane Baker, the director of the Congress for Jewish Culture, a 74-year-old uh, Yiddish cultural organization based in New York. At one time, we did have branches in Argentina, where Perlis Ney is right now, and in Paris. Uh, but now we're down to New York. Uh, the Tsiko uh, is our publishing arm and uh, bookstore. And the Tsiko uh, published, wound up publishing, although there were incarnations of it, the uh, Algemeine Encyclopedia that we're going to hear about this evening. Um, you can check out more about our activities on congressforjewishculture.org. I'll put that into chat. You can get books uh, at uh, tsiko.org. And uh, I think that that's enough about where we are right now because we have a rich program coming uh, with our associate, so to speak, untitled, but uh, very important player with the Congress, Rachel Kafferson. Uh, playwright, journalist, if you don't read her column, Rochel's Golden City and Tablet. Uh, I'll put in a link for that as well. Um, she goes in depth on really interesting and sometimes unexpected uh, topics in the world of Yiddish, as well as uh, cataloging Yiddish happenings the world across, which we can all attend now, thanks to Mr. Pandemic. Um, Rochel will introduce Barry, the guest, but uh, I've introduced Rochel, so Rochel, take it away. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you, and also thanks to the Congress for making this program possible. And I'm sorry, but I just have to make a joke because it didn't occur to me until now that the pandemic is actually Polish because its name is Pandemic. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I, I just I had to say that. So, Barry. Um, okay, good, you're on camera. So I'm so glad to have Barry with us. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about him before we dive in. Uh, Barry Trachtenberg is a historian of modern European and American Jewry. And he holds the Rubin Presidential Chair in Jewish History at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. He is the author of three books, The 2008 Revolutionary Roots of Modern Yiddish, 1903 to 1917, the 2018, The United States and the Nazi Holocaust, Race, Refuge, and Remembrance, and the recently published Holocaust and the Exile of Yiddish, A History of the Algemeine Encyclopedia. And here is a copy of the book. It's really beautiful. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't show up so well on Zoom because it's sort of like a white on cream thing, but this is actually the title and it's got this gorgeous photo of the volumes all the volumes of the encyclopedia together. And as you'll notice, um, it doesn't look like your normal encyclopedia set in that normally an encyclopedia is many volumes, but they are unified. And what you see here is uh, a lack of coherence. Um, so, Barry, um, I don't have to do anything like with the view button to get us to, to be on the screen together, do I? No, I think we're on the screen. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is really a fun thing for me. Um, you know, I just think reference books are really cool. <laughs> and, um, oh, what I wanted to do before I jumped in here was to show that I actually own uh, one volume of the uh, encyclopedia. This is a uh, bond Yidden Aleph, which, you know, is kind of a strange thing. What does that mean, Yidden Aleph? Well, um, Jews do have their own numbering system, but this gives us a clue that the uh, encyclopedia had sort of this two track system. So, um, why don't we start off, Barry, by having you say kind of what the encyclopedia is, because that's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, so why don't we start there? So at least the people who haven't been following along or haven't read my column about it, um, haven't read the book, tell them what it is just briefly. 
Yeah, I'd be happy to. And first, I just want to say thank you so much for your lovely column and for this wonderful opportunity to have this conversation. I'm really grateful um, to you, to Shane, to the Congress. Um, I, if I could, I'll share my screen and Great. I can show you that the full photo of what a complete set of original encyclopedias looks like. So can you see that there? Ah, uh, yes. All right. Beautiful. So you'll see um, there's multiple numbering systems and two languages. And this one volume on the far right um, that exists outside of that entirely. So I, I came to research on this project because in 2006, Gennady Estreich asked me if I would contribute to a, a, a journal issue on Jewish encyclopedias. And I owned, like you, one or two copies of the Algamay Encyclopedia. And he, I said, sure, I'll write on that, not knowing what I was getting into, not knowing that I would get into this project that would take me the next 15 years, you know, much of my time over the next 15 years, and to many spots around the globe, really, um, as a way to uh, con contend with it. Um, so starting from right to left, what we have here, this very, very skinny volume, is a, a probeheft, one of two, so a sample, a, like a sample volume or a specimen volume of the encyclopedia. This one was, was published in Berlin, Germany in 1932. And there's very few copies in the libraries around the world of this, because this was really just a marketing document. It wasn't something necessarily that people would hold on to. But then you can see that there's a bond uh, uh, one through five that's here. Um, and these are volumes of the, the Algamena Encyclopedia, where the focus is on general knowledge. All, that's the Algamena part of the encyclopedia. And if you look at the very bottom here, you can see what some of these uh, volumes go to. The first is Aleph through Atlantic City, for example, right? And, you, and it goes through. And these volumes, volumes one through four, were not published in Berlin, but they were published in Paris, where the encyclopedias had to flee. Um, after the, uh, uh, the you know Hitler's ascension to uh, to power in January of 1933, so this probe half comes out in 32. There's actually another one they release in January of 33, the same month that Hitler comes to power. Um, the encyclopedists, who you know who we'll talk about, um, had to flee, so the, the most fled to Paris, where they published the first four volumes, and then though. In 1939, in response to the worsening conditions faced by Jews throughout Europe, they released the first, if you skip past number five and go to this one, you'll see, you can't really make it out, but at the bottom it says Yidin. You can see the two Aleph, the Dalit, and the longer Nun there. Yidin Aleph, it's very, very tiny, but it's there. They released this volume in response to the, the worsening situation, and they felt that there needed to be a volume that would depict the, the totality of Jewish life. And in particular, the, sort of the, the, the most important contributions of Eastern European Jewry to the world. They needed to codify this because they recognized that there was a disaster coming. Obviously they didn't recognize the scope or the extent of it. The next volume over, the one that still remains in a slip case is one of the very few copies of this um, Yidin base volume that survives. This was published in the spring of 1940. So after the war begins, this is published in Paris. The main audience by this time period, since Poland is cut off from um, the, the encyclopedias in Paris because it's under uh, Nazi and Soviet occupation. So the most of the volumes were shipped to America. That ship is lost at sea, presumably sunk by a U-boat, but a few copies were sent to the Tsiko in um, New York and survived. And I was able to find one of these copies at, at the Tsiko. Uh, so now, two years later, they published Yidin Gimel. Now they're in New York. So they've escaped. They've, the encyclopedias have fled uh, from Paris. They've uh, followed the path of, of many refugees. They went south to Marseille crossed the Pyrenees into Spain, made their way to Lisbon, and in, and in the late summer, early fall of 1940, land in New York, where they have with them the manuscript for Yidin Gimel, 
And what we see is this transition of the focus of the encyclopedia away from knowledge of the world to specifically Jewish knowledge in response to the worsening conditions faced by European Jews. After Yin Gimel is published, they then actually publish uh, the, the fifth volume of the general volumes. And then from that point on, they publish four more volumes in the Yin series. So what was initially intended to be a supplement, there's supposed to be one volume um, given at the end of 20 volumes of general knowledge for subscribers as sort of a bonus volume, um, overtakes the entire project. So by 1944, they've abandoned the, the, the commitment to publishing general knowledge and realize what they need to do is to publish the, the, the most important sort of facts and information about Eastern European Jewry to preserve it as a, 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 a document that can be of use to American Jews who they see as, uh, in the post-war period, in the post horum period, as carrying the mantle, really, you know, carrying the burden of, of leading world Jewry. So these final volumes are, are quite fascinating. Um, one is as a history of Jews in America, and the final two volumes, which are not published until 1964 and 1966, are volumes on the Churban, and they represent some of the, the, the first uh, attempts to produce collaborative histories. These three, I'm sorry, these four volumes that exist on the left came out starting in the, the 1940s um, and, and continued until the mid-1950s. And this Jewish people past and present initially was supposed to be one, and then it became two, and then ultimately three. And they thought they were finished at three. And then in response to the uh, 300th anniversary of Jews in America, they published the fourth volume. And what's in, contained in these are many translations of, of articles that were published in the Yiddish, but also new, new works to be published in the English, some of which were then translated into Yiddish and published in later volumes of the encyclopedia. So like you said, um, normally when we think of an encyclopedia, we, you know, we think of something like this, right? The, the Encyclopedia Judaica. We, we think this, here's a slide of the, the Jewish encyclopedia. We, we think of, we, 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 you know, we, when we think of encyclopedia, we imagine in terms of order, of coherence, of uniformity. Um, and this is very much inspired by, you know, the notions of the enlightenment, you know, where encyclopedia was to contain all the knowledge of the world in an orderly standard fashion. And instead, what we have with the Yiddish encyclopedia is really this symbol of the, the chaos and transformation, and in many ways, really the resilience of Yiddish culture during this time of great turmoil. That's probably a much longer introduction than you wanted, sorry. No, well, I think that was really perfect. Thank you, Barry, because okay. with something like this, um, it's really hard to give a one sentence answer because it is such a complicated sort of convoluted story, but also that makes it a lot more interesting. Um, and there's a couple things. Um, if you wanna, um, can you end the uh, slide or, or are there more slides you wanna show right now? Uh, I can show some later or not as, as, as we need. Um, so there's a couple ways to talk about this project. Uh, one is by the material, uh, which is very interesting. And there's some interesting questions to ask about the material that was chosen and produced to put in these volumes. And then there's the story of the people, the men, mostly men who uh, made the decision, who pushed it forward, who really carried this project forward through the worst possible circumstances, but felt themselves really uh, obligated to it for their own reasons. Um, so there's these two different tracks and I, and I wanna talk about both, um, but let's maybe start by talking about um, the material that went in the encyclopedia. Um, this, you know, this was the age of encyclopedias, the age of enlightenment, still this idea that, you know, um, people could be uplifted and educated and knowledge could be democratized, right, by uh, creating these encyclopedias in the languages that the masses read. And if the Jewish masses were reading Yiddish, give them Yiddish, right? Um, of course, um, as Barry noted, the uh, encyclopedia project was actually inaugurated in Berlin. Um, so, you know, already, as he says in the book, 
uh, at a remove, the, the editors and writers uh, and conceivers of the encyclopedia were at a remove from the people that they felt they were serving, which is itself part of the story. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about the general knowledge volumes? Because in a way they're the most, I think, kind of poignant um, that, you know, uh, how the, in the general knowledge volumes, what, what were the discussions going on, the criteria for what might go in, what was important, what did they feel was important that um, Yiddish speaking masses should have access to? Sure. Um, so the uh, general volumes, of course, only make it partway through the letter base. Um, which on the, the, the one hand is, is, you know, not very much, right? Um, on the other, we should note that there were many previous attempts to publish Yiddish encyclopedias, and they never made it through Aleph. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of a great victory. And about 20% of the words in Yiddish, like say in the Weinreich Dictionary, begin with Aleph. So it's a, it's a pretty significant sort of chunk in, in a way. And, um, and let's just just pause here to give a shout out to the Groyser Wörterbuch, which is another yes. famous reference book, uh, which um, you know was supposed to be this massive multi-volume Oxford-style dictionary of twenty volumes, fifteen volumes, and they published four, yeah. uh, all Aleph. Yeah, and which is literally propping up my laptop as we speak. <laughs> it's like two of the volumes here. It brings it just exactly to the right level for a Zoom chat. <laughs> so Aleph through Bayes yes. is substantial. It's, a, it's, you know, at least the, they're getting somewhere. So, yeah. what kind of so there, there was enormous debates around uh, the beginning of this encyclopedia. So it was um, inspired by uh, Shimon Dubnovs, the, sort of the great historian of Eastern European Jewry, who was really one of the first to insist upon focusing on the, the material aspects of, of the Jewish people. So he wasn't interested necessarily in um, you know, tracing the, the spiritual lineage of Jews, but really looking at what he called their sociological aspects, what we would think of uh, many ways as you know, their, their uh, material sides. You know, he looked at demography and economics and so on. And so uh, the people who gathered, um, who were in Berlin um, to celebrate his 70th, really thought that they would create an encyclopedia sort of in his honor, but also saw themselves as disciples in many ways. And so wanted to create an encyclopedia um, um, that would bring that sort of knowledge of the sort of the new social sciences really to um, Yiddish speakers. Not, you know, they estimate about nine to 10 million in the world at, at that time. And there was, but there was fierce debates um, in the late twenties and early thirties as this project was getting underway. And these debates actually continued for many, many years um, while the encyclopedia was being published. Cause the debate was what sort of knowledge do Yiddish speaking Jews need? Do they need self-knowledge? Do they need knowledge about um, Jewish history, Jewish culture? Um, and much of sort of the new Jewish social sciences that were coming out of Evo and other places, or do they need knowledge of the world, right? So do they need um, a, a, a document that was going to sort of ground them in the world that they were in, or was it going to be one that would really sort of teach them about themselves, right? So someone like Max Weinreich, for example, thought that the Yiddish encyclopedia need to be a Jewish encyclopedia. He lost those debates initially because uh, the majority of people who, who gathered around this project really insisted that what Jews needed and Dubnov was among them was access to the knowledge of the world that was being produced. And so ultimately the, the, the founders agreed upon this 70-30 split and sometimes it was an 80-20 split uh, where they said 80% of the material would be on knowledge of the world and 20% would be on Jews. So not Judaism, but Jews themselves. And most of that would be contained in that supplement that I referred to, which ultimately came to overtake the, the project. But when it came to the 80% or 70% of what was gonna be contained, they really saw it as being as encompassing as possible, right? So they modeled themselves after the, the French LaRousse or the English Britannica, and they, they wanted uh, uh, sort of the, the best of the social sciences and best of 
the world of the humanities to be in, you know, present in this work. They saw it as a way to bring scientific knowledge, to bring knowledge of current events to Jews. And they really saw it as a work for sort of the, the everyday Yiddish reader who didn't have time to go to libraries, who couldn't re, you know, attend lectures, who, you know, who, who just needed a book to pull off the shelf to understand the larger world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, can you talk a little bit then if that's the general knowledge, actually, maybe we can um, go back to slide sharing and can you show okay. us a slide or two from uh, what those general knowledge volumes look like? Yeah, what, absolutely. Um, I have a couple choices. So um, why don't I show you what the, the first probe heft looks like? And the, the reason why this is helpful, and so this is the one volume that's digitized and it can be accessed at the, the National Yiddish Book Center's site. And so here's the, the front page of it. Sorry, Algemeine Encyclopedia Probehef, Dubnov Fund, Berlin, 1932, right? So the reason why I think this is useful because even though this was an advertising document, it was the only sort of, it's, it's the only snapshot that we have of how they imagined the entire project to have looked like had it gone according to plan, right? Had not historical events just interrupted the project entirely. So if we skip through this, there's a fascinating introduction which sort of makes the case uh, for the encyclopedia. Um, but if we look at some of the, the, the different you know, uh, items that are contained, you'll, you'll see you know, that it's very much like kind of a regular encyclopedia with a sort of Jewish emphasis in a way, and really a, a Yiddish emphasis in some ways. So there's entries on obelisks and insulin, right? So those are the, the first two here, and we can scroll through. So you can see this. Yeah, Rachel, you can yes. see this. Okay. Um, and so you can see, right, the, the, there's something on orthography, right? Mm -hmm. And so this piece is by Zalman Rezin, right, who wrote the first, really one of the first grammars in Yiddish. And so it's about orthography in general, but then there's a, a, a significant discussion on, on Yiddish orthography a, a, as well. Um, you can see here's one of my favorite ones, dinosaur here, where there's a, a brontosaurus, right, you know, who's you know, way out of scale from what, you know, it's, you know, not, you know, uh, 10 times larger than a steam engine. <laughs> um, and, and, and so it's sort of wonderful in a way, but it also contains lots of, of sort of specifically Jewish topics as well, right? And so you can see, you know, the, the, there's paintings here, there's discussions of Chagall in, in this volume. There's, here's an entry here um, by Yakov Lischinski on Jewish demography. Um, and so in, you see these charts here, um, I think this top one is contained in the book that, that shows the dispersion of, of, of Jews um, in the world um, and shifts over time, right, 1825 compared to 1930. So you can see, you know, uh, shifts in Jewish population. And so this gives you a sense kind of of what the Encyclopedia was supposed to look like. And those first, or the volumes one through five are, a, fa a fairly good representation of this, although they actually contain much more sort of Jewish knowledge or knowledge of Jews than what that 70-30 split really, uh, you know, was supposed to contain. Okay, so then let's talk about the Jewish volumes, because the question sure. is, you know, what is Jewish knowledge? What is worthy of talking about? What is, you know, important enough to include in an encyclopedia about Jews and Judaism and Jewishness? Sure. Yeah. So let me share my screen again, if that's all right. Um, I'm going to switch over to a PowerPoint that I have here. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the, the, the shift to those Yidin volumes actually begins in the middle of the general volumes or really uh, while those are being published. So, you know, throughout you know, volumes one and two and most of three, it looks a lot like that Probehef did, right? So just, you know, entries after entries, ranging no more than, you know, a, a, a few columns or so at, at most. But all of a sudden at the end of the third volume, there's this very long multi-authored essay on the topic of anti-Semitism, which is in the correct place alphabetically, 
but really entirely out of place in terms of what the encyclopedia is supposed to be about. And that was like my first clue that there's this shift happening in the project. The next volume that comes out, um, volume four in 1937, has a long entry on Eretz Royal Palestine. Or, um, and it's really quite fascinating. Again, it's multi-authored. Again, it appears at the very end of the volume. And although it, it fits alphabetically, it's utterly out of place. You know, it, it, and, and it points to, again, this attention um, that the encyclopedias are, are trying to pay to the worsening situations faced by Jews, but to stick to the form of the encyclopedia. And what happens though, is that then they just recognize that by the, really they recognize by 1938, right? Which is this year of terrible rupture. It's the year of Kristallnacht. It's the year when Germany takes Austria and the Anschluss and the first acts really of horrific violence against Jews we see by the, by the Nazis. It's at this point that they recognize that they need to, to sort of begin shifting their attention in this considerable way. And so we have these two volumes, the Yidin Aleph and Yidin Base, which are published in Paris in 1939 and 1940. Um, and, and these volumes are fascinating. So the beginning of Yidin Aleph, for example, is um, written by a Jewish anthropologist, uh, Grutzkus, on Jewish types, right? And so this is really one of the it's fascinating and disturbing, it's right? Disturbing. And so these are Jewish <laughs> types. And so I think from our lens today, we see this as sort of deeply Orientalist. This, this, this is you know, racist in different ways. Um, and yet what they were trying to make the case was that they were pushing against these notions of the Nazis you know, th that insist that racial purity is really the hallmark of a nation's strength. And what they were trying to communicate is that no, it's the diversity which is our strength, that we are this worldly people whose strength is actually our intermixing, right? Both um, in terms of our historical path and in terms of you know, our, our physical composition with the people of, of the world, right? Because these are diaspora nationalists, right? These are people who believe themselves to be Jews, but who believe themselves to exist within the world and not sort of separate from it, as you know, Zionists were arguing at the time. Although some, many of these folks, you know, change their mind or soften their views um, in response to worsening conditions. Yeah. Um, in fact, this was something that I talked about in my column because it's so striking. If you're just flipping through, and I have, you know, the volume Yidden Aleph, because from our point of view today, it still seems as if they are. Um, you know, assuming some, there's some kind of basis to racial science, right? Like when you say that, when you want to talk about the phenotypicality, as it were, right, of, you yeah. know, this is a Russish, and this is a, you know, Litvish, and this is a this, and this is a that, it's like, you know. It's, yeah, oh, it's super uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> um, but everybody bought, you know, bought into this at the time. Right. Um, and it's not really until at this moment when it's starting to get challenged in, in significant ways. And that actually plays out in Jewish people past and present, the first of the English language volumes, because the, the very first essay is an argument you know, fully against that. It's just anti-eugenics essay. It's really quite, quite fascinating. Um, but what we also see is even in the, the general volumes, you know, when they talk, for example, about um, uh, a Central European country, you know, like, like Austria, Hungary, when they talk about Austro-Hungarian Empire, they talk about it in terms of its achievements and they, they, they have photos of, you know, the beautiful buildings and the, the parliaments and so on. And then as they move eastward, there's an essay on Ukraine and it's pictures of sort of Ukrainian peasants as sort of the archetype. But then when it has an uh, essay on Abyssinia, Ethiopia, right? It starts with, you know, a, a photo of a, a young topless girl, right? And, and it's just like horrifying that that exists. And a picture of the Emperor Haile Selassie without ever mentioning him by name. Oh, dear. Okay. Yeah, and, and a very similar thing for Australia. The only images of Australia are of uh, Australian Aborigines with like very, very dramatic facial markings as if that's the, the type. Right, 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 right. And so, I mean, they're products of their time. Absolutely. And you have to acknowledge this, right? They're, 
they have all of, they, they live in a world that's that's shaped by orientalism as much as they live in a world shaped by patriarchy and all, all of these things and that's reflected in the work absolutely so um we have a question from the chat and i think it's a really interesting question and um it's a complicated question because it changes as with many things about this project it changed over time but if you can kind of give us a general idea about who was guiding or steering this enormous project and you know what people have to imagine if you haven't read the book yet is that you have this group of incredibly um, well educated highly motivated um, activists and scholars in the world. So this was not like a, a milk toast group of people. These were people with uh, a lot of opinions. Um, so you get these people together and they, there were a lot of really difficult decisions to be made. And I think that's part of the reason, aside from the historical you know, events, but there were some of the, the questions around the encyclopedia were so difficult that it took a lot of time to hash out exactly how they were going to approach various things. So um, can you tell us how was it being guided? Who was in charge? Was anybody in charge? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. So at the core were these Eastern European Jews who were in exile from the Soviet Union who landed in Berlin in the 1920s, in large part because of economic reasons, right? The hyperinflation that existed in Germany made it very possible for people um, who were living in Germany but producing items for export um, to actually live you know, quite well. Because if you're, you're, you're bringing in, say, Polish slotties or American dollars and converting them to marks, you can actually live off your your intellectual work, right? And so you have what what the one of the consequences of this is that Berlin is Berlin in, in the 1920s is this incredibly dynamic world, right? Uh, it's one of the most sort of international places in Europe, it's one of the most dynamic, exciting cities to, um, to be in. And so Jews were a part of that, right? So it's one of the centers for Hebrew and Yiddish publishing, really, in, in the 1920s. Um, by the end of that decade, many of those folks had left the mark the 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 uh, German mark had stabilized, many had left, but some had stuck around, right? So among those who stuck around uh, were Dubnov himself, who was still there um, in the late 1920s, but also really the, the, the key figures at the outset uh, were some figures associated with YIVO, like Yakov Leschinsky, who I mentioned, also um, uh, Elias Cherikover, who was uh, you know, one of the chief historians of, of YIVO, um, Avram Rosen, who uh, ended up founding um, uh, Affen Shedweg, um, you know, in the, the 1940s in the United States. He's one of the founders of the, the League for Yiddish and the Territorialist Movement. Um, but really the guiding figure more than any of them was someone who's probably unknown today to most scholars and, and followers uh, of Yiddish. And that was Rafael Abramovich. Now, Rafael Bermovich is very well known in sort of far leftist circles to this day because he was the head of the Mensheviks in exile. So the, the, he was a former Bundist himself who had who turned over to the, the Mensheviks after the, the 1905 Russian Revolution. Um, and so maintained these strong ties to the, the Bund, but really was the chief spokesperson for the Mensheviks worldwide. So he traveled regularly, was an avowed enemy of, of Stalin. Um, and you know, spent much of his 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 career really fighting against the Soviet Union, but trying to do so in a way that would sort of preserve the best of the the revolution, the 1917 revolution, and always hoping to sort of get back into to power. Um, and yet, you know, he had to make a living, right? He had to make a living, and how he made much of his living is he published. Lots of journalism in Yiddish. He was a correspondent for the Forwärts from Berlin, along with Weinreich for a period of time in Leschinsky. And he also wrote a whole series of, of different works. Um, he, you know, popular histories. Um, he attempted another point in his life to, to actually write an encyclopedia in Yiddish, which didn't go anywhere. <laughs> and um, so he ends up taking on this project, and it serves for him, I think, many purposes for. For Abramovich, one, he you know, had this deep commitment to the project. He believed in the values of it. He also saw it as a way to sort of, um, sort of keep kind of Menshevik politics alive in the Yiddish world. Um, and 
on a much more practical level, it became a way for him to sort of funnel money to many of his Menshevik colleagues by having them write um, entries for the encyclopedia. Um, yeah. So he sticks with this project uh, longer than nearly every other person from the beginning to the end. And, you know, he ends up leaving the project in the 1950s. By, by this time, you know, he's in America. Um, he's living on the Upper West Side. Um, and he's nearly blind. Um, and he then writes his magnum opus, which is uh, writing a sort of a history of the founding of the Soviet Union from the Menshevik perspective, mm -hmm. which is published right when he dies in the early 60s. Wow. Um, so we have a, another question from the chat, which is something that I, I wanted to talk about, um, which is that the, the people who become associated with the project along the way, whether they stay for a long time or they don't, are this very interesting slice of the um, Jewish political world, um, which is both narrow, but also incredibly variegated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's the kind of like, I, as I was reading the book and I was, you know, noticing the different names and these are, most of them were names that I was familiar with, not Abramovich, but others. And, you know, it's like people I would, intuitively like kind of say yes they all have a certain something in common but it's kind of hard to put a box around them because they had so much you know yeah. uh they had many differences with each other so if you can just tell us a little bit about the various slices that were represented by the people associated with the project yeah so if we can think of sort of the, the jewish political spectrum right the slice sort of that this group occupies in some ways um if you think of like 1920s 1930s jewish politics is they position themselves against the communists, like the Bolsheviks. Anti-Bolshevik. Yeah, so they're yeah, anti-Bolsheviks. So the, yeah. the Bolsheviks are to their left politically and the general Zionists are to their right politically, right? Which would make you think this is a narrow band, narrow slice, but actually it can, so what that means is it contains labor Zionists, it contains Bundes, it contains diaspora nationalists of all sorts, it contains Jewish socialists, it contains Mensheviks, right? And so it's these groups that what sort of unites them to some extent um, is sort of is a commitment to a working class ethos, right? This is what much of what they share, although they're not all socialists, right? They're committed to the Yiddish language, although they're not all Yiddishists, and they're committed to a form of Jewish nationalism, although they're not all Zionists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so th they meet in these ways, but they but they fight, right? Um, and what becomes fascinating is that although that's a fairly narrow band of the spectrum, this narrow band is trying to encompass knowledge of the entire world, right? But what happens is that as the scope of the encyclopedia itself narrows to Jewish topics, right? the spectrum of who gets involved increases, right? So in those Yidin volumes, for example, you have figures like Gershom Sholem, who's writing, who would never have gone near the project when it was simply on knowledge of the world. But all of a sudden, he, you know, he publishes works in, in some of the early Yidin volumes, his works on, on Jewish mysticism, works on, on uh, Hasidism, appear in those volumes. Mm -hmm. So it's really quite fascinating because Jewish politics are changing so radically in this period that people who would never have considered publishing it in its early iterations then participate in its later versions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, that's how you end up getting, well, not exactly how, but um, you also have some figures who are kind of surprising towards the end, for example, the um, participation of the author, philosopher, Jewish historian, Shimon Ravidovich. Yeah. Who yeah. Was, he, he was known as a Hebraist. He was a Zionist. And yet, like, he had this whole other side. Yeah. But he was also a diasporist, right? He believed in the sort of the, 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 the necessity of maintaining Jewish life and indeed Hebrew life in the diaspora. And so he was brought in in what became the very last sort of years of the encyclopedia, actually to revive it. So long after the, the Aleph Base volumes, the general volumes had been um, disbanded, he was brought in to sort of resuscitate those. Um, 
And yet they were supposed to be on Jewish topics, interestingly. So they were going to actually publish a Jewish encyclopedia following the alphabet. So they, they, they brought him in um, and he gets going and he, he begins to edit many works and then suffers two heart attacks and dies um, mm-hmm. just a few months after joining the project. Um, and so it's sort of one blow among many blows. And so, you know, in many ways, this whole project is de- defined by it stops and starts and its sudden changes. Um, and not even all of them are visible in the volumes themselves. Right. And so this is where the, you know, the archives prove so fruitful. Um, and I wanna say to the people watching that if you're not familiar with um, the work of uh, Shimon Ravidovich, I would highly recommend it. There's a great um, volume of his essays. I believe it's called Israel, the Ever-Dying People. And that's his most famous in English. It's his most famous um, essay and it's something that gets referred to all the time he himself though I feel like his work has kind of not um you know maintained as much intellectual currency and I think that's a shame because he's such a fascinating yeah. thinker but there's there's a, a it's a, a I wouldn't say new now but about 10 years ago my uh perfect my advisor my PhD advisor David Myers published a, a, a long essay of Ravi Dovich's called Between Jew and Arab which is really quite fascinating because Rabidovich, as much as he was proud to ha- that, that there was a Jewish state, really, you know, understood the consequences of that on the Arab population there and, and really insisted that there had to be a way for these two communities to, to, that were so intertwined with one another to a- actually embrace that intersectionality in some ways of the, the two, though that obviously wasn't his words, and to figure out a path to live together. Yeah, I mean, he he was so ahead of his time in so many ways. Um, I really like, I would encourage everybody, if that sounds interesting to you, to go seek him out. He um, talked about things like the fact that if you call this new country uh, Israel, yeah. then what did that mean for the people Israel? Um, if that was the state of Israel, then what was everybody else? Um, you know, the sort of like mystical, um, you know, ling- mystical linguistic implications of the new state. Yeah. Yeah, and he publicly had this very public fight with uh, David Ben-Gurion over this topic, yeah. Um, so, but, and, and yet his involvement with the encyclopedia is sort of like um, both brief and emblematic or quintessential yeah, yeah. of the yes, project. I think that's a very good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to uh, talk about the fact that, uh, you know, the book is full of these characters that I, you know, love and, you know, they're, they're so, um, they're always struggling and they're always the underdogs and, you know, um, all these things. And yet what's so interesting is that it's basically all men. Where were the women? Were there any women involved with the project? And why? I mean, there certainly in Berlin, there were women who were part of this intellectual life. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can. Um, so there were very few women who were actively involved with, with the project. And so it, it really posed kind of questions for me uh, as a historian as a feminist, I mean, like how to contend with this in the work, right? And, and I spoke with a lot of colleagues and trying to sort of sort this out. And um, because the reality is this is a project that was governed almost entirely by men. And there were, there were very significant contributions by women authors like uh, Rachel v- uh, Vishnitzer published long works, both in the, the English and the Yiddish um, on, on Jewish art uh, and art history. It's really fascinating. There's other works. But women are utterly um, unrepresented, both in the the authors of the work, in the editors of the work, and in the the entries themselves. So in that probeheft, for example, if if I recall, there's only one entry on a woman um, that's actually of any length. Uh, it's and it's on uh, I think it's Maria Montessori, right, <laughs> founder of the Montessori schools, um, and that's emblematic of. The, the project, right? And so they, they had these enormous blinders on. So the challenge for me as a historian to figure out is like, how do you deal with this, right? Um, so, and, and the, the other challenge is that the archives are, you know, a mess on this project, right? right. So there's no one set of archives. I mean, YIVO has a, a, a few boxes of Algaman Encyclopedia, but otherwise they're just scattered around the world. They're in Cape Town, they're in Jerusalem. So 
Wait, minute. since you mentioned Cape Town, yeah. let's, yeah. I want to talk about Schulen yeah. Schwarzbard. Yeah, let me do that in one second. Let me just finish okay. this last piece, right? Okay. So, uh, cause, no, because I think it's an important question that you're raising. I just want to give it its due, but I'll be quick. Um, so the, the strategy that I, that I sought to um, sort of embrace with this was whenever I could identify women's labor in the project, I made sure to spend time on it, mm -hmm. right? So when there's longer essays by or about women, I just focused on those, like, and, and not in a way that was like, look, here's a woman, here's a woman, you know, these guys are okay. It's like, now this is the exception to the rule. But I want to make sure that that labor that's so invisible and not really found within the archives um, very much, just try to bring as much as I could of it to the fore. And, you know, people can judge whether that's successful or not. But Schwarzbart, yeah. So, okay, thank you for that. I thought you were gonna go in a different, um, you were gonna continue down and I kind of wanted to introduce this question of the work that um, that you had to do that, as a historian of assembling the fragments of the archive from you know all these different places. And I thought talking about Schwarzbard was an interesting way to, to, to talk about that, that task. So um, first of all, Schwarzbard is both probably one of the most interesting, you know, colorful people involved with the project. So we'll, let's talk about who he is and then how he get, got involved, what he actually did for the, the encyclopedia, which is, you know, somewhat a small slice of the work okay. and, you know, yeah. not super cr critical, but still. But he's one of these fascinating figures who intersects with the project in a way yeah. that you wouldn't necessarily expect, right? So he's most famous for having been an assassin of the Ukrainian uh, sort of pogromist leader, uh, Petilor, Simon Petilora. And he assassinated him in the 1920s in Paris very publicly and you know, killed him on the street and just stood there and waited to be arrested. And his trial that took place in Paris was sort of an international cause celeb. It's what uh, brought Elias Cherikover to Paris to, to form his trial. It led to the creation of all of these archives on pogroms. And he was acquitted, right? Um, he was acquitted for this act. And he had lost you know, many, many members of his family in these po pogroms that happened during the time of the Russian Civil War. Um, and so after this, you know, he, um, who he had been a political activist and a poet, um, he uh, stays in Paris for a period of time, and then ultimately he becomes a, a, a salesperson for the encyclopedia. He needs to make a living also. And so in the, the late 1930s, he travels, as did other salespersons for the encyclopedia, to the increasing sort of Yiddish diaspora, right? Um, you know, Yiddish is moving, you know, as the book argues, kind of into its own exile. And so there's a Yiddish speaking community in Cape Town, South Africa. So he goes there and to, it, with the plan on spend, sending several months in South Africa, kind of working in the community. He's also fundraising for YIVO. He's fundraising for, for different causes. And he's there with you know, his briefcase filled with um, advertising materials for the encyclopedia. And he dies. He has a, you know, seemingly a heart attack and dies. And there's some intrigue that some people have told me that I've not been able to document. So I'll just tell you there's you know, intrigue. Um, and he was buried there initially. And then his, uh, he was ultimately buried in, in, in Israel. But at the University of Cape Town, there are several file folders of materials on, uh, on the encyclopedia. Um, and one of the benefits of this being a very long project that I started you know, in 2006 was that in 2017, I had a chance to go to Cape Town for a conference and went to the university, requested these materials, and after waiting a couple hours, they come. And in it are some of the most amazing advertising documents for the encyclopedia that don't exist in archives anywhere else in the world. Wow. And it's only because he died there, right? <laughs> had he gone back to Europe, it's very likely those materials would have been lost like nearly everything else was lost, right? And so it's this scattering of the encyclopedists to different parts of the world, like Aaron Steinberg, for example, goes to London, for example. So his papers are not only at YIVO in New York and at the Jewish People's Archives in Jerusalem, but at the University of Southampton in England, which um, you know, got the bulk of his archives. And so you just have materials sort of everywhere in the world. Abramovich's papers, for example, are in Amsterdam at the Social History Archive because his son, Mark Rain, who went off to fight um, in the Spanish Civil War uh, 
for the Pum, the same group that George Orwell fought for, and his, you know, if you read his um, homage to Catalonia book, um, Mark Rain brought his father's materials to Amsterdam first uh, for safekeeping on his way to Spain, where he was then kidnapped by Stalinist agents and assassinated in 1938. So Abramovich actually leaves the Encyclopedia Project for about a year to go find his son because there's just no information. He actually travels to Spain in the middle of the Civil War to look for his son. And so we have just all these world events that just collide with this project. And each one of these forces sort of twists and turns. But it also meant that researching this project um, just took years and years. And in this strange way, and I was talking with Shane about this um, right before the talk began, the, the COVID pandemic actually helped because many archives, um, when the pandemic began, began making their works available in digital form. And it used to be you have to travel, you'd have to go to Cape Town to look at the materials in Cape Town. But now archives like Center for Jewish History and Harvard and University of Hampton and Jerusalem are now digitizing materials for researchers. Mm -hmm. So it made it actually possible for me to, to get materials that otherwise I would have had to spend many more years because I, I can't just hop on a plane and fly to these places, right? Um, and so in, in a strange way, the pandemic actually made it an, another world event colliding, right? Made it possible for me to actually complete this project. Mm. Um, you know, as I think about uh, the, you know, the materials being dispersed around the world in this kind of random way, I think about the ship that sank with the, uh, you know, Yidden Bays, right? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of, there are these stories about, like, um, there was a ship that sank, I think, with um, uh, Garfield phones. And so there, like, there's a shore in Brittany yes, where- they Garfield wash up on. I've heard of this. <laughs> <laughs> they keep- Garfield phones keep washing up and I think oh you know maybe the Yidden Bays maybe that was oh. in a box it's at the bottom of the sea maybe we can get um what's his name uh Cameron you know like if he raised the Titanic he can raise the boat <laughs> that has the encyclopedia <laughs> on it you know they're not plastic unfortunately <laughs> but yeah. maybe they were in like a, a watertight you know uh box I can dream you can dream you know. <laughs> Really, though, what we need is for these works to be digitized, right? And so they can be widely available, they can be searchable, you know, and that's, you know, depending on how well this book goes, if the reception's strong, I can make the case, you know, uh, to get grant money to try to do some of that work. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, oh, Faith has to run. Um, but Faith, do you have any questions? I feel like you'll, you. all right, Faith, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat or tell us now. Um, so, um, you know, I, I want to talk about uh, something that everybody, you know, I think who's on the talk right now can relate to, which is uh, fundraising. Um, <laughs> you know, again, this is a, a really important part of the story in your book that, it, you know, every step of the way, uh, you know, it was so difficult for, for them to raise funds, as it was for many of these other uh, Yiddish reference books. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, so in many ways, this project is defined by its poverty, you know, um, as they, the encyclopedias themselves note in many of their sort of grant applications, and even in, I think it's the introduction in the Proba Heft, they're like, unlike every other encyclopedia project, right, we don't have a government behind us, we don't have a major academy behind us, we don't have large donors behind us, what we have are the people themselves, right, so this is a project of the people. And so they're constantly on the search just to find the money to piece together each volume. And, and that accounts in, in many ways for much of the, 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 the long lags between the different volumes, really just one volume a year comes out and that's when it's going well in, in some ways. You know, but also, um, you know, like disasters befall the, the project. So for example, they. They have a fundraiser, Nochem Gergel, who was also um, uh, one of the figures who really investigated the, the pogroms in Ukraine during the, the Civil War. Um, he is appointed the, the chief fundraiser for this project. They have a subscription model at the outset. He goes to America. There's big sort of banquets in honor of the encyclopedia. And then he dies. And, you know, um, and it's just a huge personal loss. 
to the, the figures involved. It's a loss to the, the world of, of Yiddish letters, but it's also just a terrible loss to the encyclopedia itself. And then of course, when they have to leave um, Germany and go to Paris, right? They're all scattered. Individually, they all have to find work, yeah. right? They have to support themselves and their families. They're supporting their political causes, whether it's territorialism or labor Zionism or Menshevism. And then they also have this encyclopedia project they're working on that they need to try to find money for. Um, and it's, it's just kind of this continuing disaster. You know, by the time um, that things sort of get rolling for the project and it starts to become somewhat self-supportive, like World War II begins and they come to America and they have to do it all over again. Right? And so they get funding, they get funding from the, the Tsiko, they get funding from different Jewish organizations, from the Atran family, from, from other uh, donor groups. Ultimately, in the last volumes are published by the, the, the Conference on Material Claims Against Germany. So reparations money, you know, as a consequence of the Holocaust, funds the last volumes of the project. That's right. But they never have enough money. You know, they have such poverty that when they need to actually look in other encyclopedias to see like how to write say on x-rays, they have to go to the public library to look them up because they can't afford just to buy a set of encyclopedias for themselves oi. to use as models. Oi, like, oi, oi. That's how poor they are. <laughs> Um, all right, so it's 8.03. I want to see if, does anybody have any questions, either if you want to put them in the chat or you want to unmute yourself, um, if there's stuff that we haven't touched on or you, you know, want clarification or if we went to, we got a little too esoteric. Um, are there any questions from the, the Oilem here? Okay, well, okay, nobody's speaking up. Um, I have more questions. Um, so you already mentioned, for example, that Seco in New York, and and this the story of the encyclopedia is as much as it is a Berlin story. It's a Paris story. It's also a New York story. Yes. Um, um, so it, you know you have these names that which will be very familiar to people Yiddishists who live in New York, especially. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the you have the Atran House, the Atran Foundation. You have Tsiko. So, can you just say a little bit about how Tsiko and Atran House and the Congress um, intersected sure. with the project? Sure. So, when the project comes to America, so that that first volume, uh, that uh, well, that volume that's lost at sea, that Eden Base volume, you know, that is published in the spring of 1940. By December of 1940, Tsiko funded a reprint of, of that work. And so the volume that most people have is either that reprint or there was a, a second reprinting of that volume that came out in 1948, I believe, where they republished everything up to that point. And so the, the project would not have survived without SICO, um, which you know, uh, was the publishing arm of the, the, the Congress um, or is the publishing arm of the Congress. Um, and so for several volumes, there's the, the Dubnov Fund name, which was the original name, and then Tsiko as well. Eventually, the, the project takes on its own life and sort of splits away from, from, from uh, Tsiko because they're able to get funds from groups like, like the Atran family. And, and there, there, there's others, sort of other Jewish donors at the time. There's the Racklin family and others that come to mind. Um, but it's never enough, right? It's, 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 it's absolutely never enough. And they bounce around, you know, for a long time, the project is just run out of Abramovich's apartment mm. on, um, I think it's like 112th Street. Mm. Um, and it turns out that um, it's the same building as my colleague who lives on the, uh, who, who works on the other side of the wall uh, for me. It's the same building that she grew up in. Uh, and when I told her that the rent in uh, the late 40s was $914 a year. She nearly lost her mind. Uh, her mother still lives in the building. Um, <laughs> but for a long time, it was just run out of, you know, people's apartments. It was run out of the same building that, that housed Evo for a period of time. Um, it was in uh, the original Atran building um, and, and just moved around, but never had any sort of stability. Right, right. You know? As, uh, you know, as we see through its entire history. Yeah. And its final sort of resting place in, in such a way was uh, the, the Tsiko building in the, uh, the, the, I think it was the second Atran building just above Union Square. Mm. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And that's where I first sort of encountered the encyclopedia because I remember when I was first working on this researching at Evo in 2008, I called Seiko and um, asked for Hyatt Wolf. And so, you know, I got him on the phone and he tells the story that I relate in, in the work where he says, you know, to me, you're calling about the encyclopedia? Like, in my nine years, nobody's ever asked me about the encyclopedia. Like, come over, my basement is full of them. <laughs> and, and I go there and he brings me down to the basement um, and floor to ceiling are just volumes and volumes of those last uh, two uh, numbers, uh, uh, which were on the Horben, which uh, were, they, they published, I think about 1500 each and most of them were still in his basement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would love to do a whole other talk about the way the, way the um, encyclopedia editors talked about the Holocaust because they were so close to it, you know, when they started to do that work. And, you know, it would be great to, to talk about what they included um, and how they did it and what the reception was. It's a little bit of a, it's too big, I think, for us to get into now. So I wanna, well, first of all, you, you do talk about it in the book. So I wanna, I want you to tell people where they can get the book and there is a oh, discount you. code. Yeah. Woo. Sure. So let's- Yeah, let's, so let's thank you for what that. Want. So, um, there's a couple ways. So I, I, I will, if I can figure out how to put this in the, the, the chat, there's a way to add a document. Oh, there, I think it went. Oh, great, okay. Uh, so there's a flyer for a discount code for the book. But I think actually if you use this other discount code, it's even cheaper. So I'm gonna type it in. Okay, Because um, for a while it worked. So if you put in RUP50, mm -hmm. I think it's even cheaper. And that's buying and it from where? directly from Rutgers University Press and includes free shipping. Okay. Oh, fabulous. So, however, I just learned today that they're, that audible.com is going to publish an audio version of the book. So sometime oh. in the next year. So I just learned this a few hours ago and I was very thrilled and honored that there's going to be an audio version. And I almost only listen to things on audiobook now because mm -hmm. I, I have a seven-year-old and I need bifocals, but I'm resisting it. And I have a dog that needs to be walked 90 minutes every morning. And so I just oh. listen to audiobooks after audiobooks. And so I'm thrilled that someday I'll be able to hear my own book on audio. Yeah. But you're going to have to work with them for a while to teach them how to say like Leschinsky. Yes. And... But yes. <laughs> I, I'm got, I'm, I will not be the reader of this book. I'll have to, <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah, you're going to have to find somebody who can do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Oh, so uh, there is a comment here from Leah Arroyo, who says, I work for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and uh, she wants to put in a plug for yes. the Collections and Reference Resources grants. Yes. The NEH was one of the very first um, uh, gr grant grantors for this project. Uh, so really the startup money was from an NEH summer grant. So I owe an enormous debt to the NEH. And Maybe I guess I'll, maybe I'll go back. Uh, <laughs> well, so that leads to yeah, a question that someone just dropped yeah. in the chat here. Yeah. Are there any locations you did not get to go to complete the research? Some places I didn't go personally, but I was able to get the materials. Um, so I didn't go, for example, to the University of Southampton, where um, Aaron Steinberg's uh, collections are at. But what I did was I requested everything I could, right? And so there may be some materials I didn't get to myself. I didn't go to the archives in Jerusalem myself. I hired um, a colleague of mine, uh, Barbara Schmutzler, who you may know, she's in the, the Yiddish world in New York. Um, oh she yeah, was in, my neighbor. Was, yeah, oh yeah. So she's a friend of mine from when I was in, a grad student there. Uh, so she very graciously spent many hours. Uh, we were able, I was able to, uh, to get grant money for that. Uh, so she did research there. So there's not archives that I know of that I haven't had a chance to look at. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, and, uh, oh, David Braun wants to know if Arne Steinberg is that Judmund Steinberg's brother, the philosopher? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I believe that's, that is the case. Okay. Uh, Arne Steinberg was the head of the with Zhitlovsky of the philosophy section of the encyclopedia. Okay. I believe that's the case. I'll have um, to confirm though. All right, David, he's gonna confirm that. Um, 
so I have a question, which is that, you know, if you browse through the uh, encyclopedia, right? I'm browsing through um, Olive. Eden, Eden Olive here. I've got my Olive here. And it's we arranged this in advance. <laughs> it's, full, it's full of really great stuff. Well, I mean, there's a couple things. Like, first of all, do you, is there anything that you would like to, you know, to oh, show? Like there's full color maps, which is really nice. And what they couldn't afford, right? But they still did it, which was, a, this is a map of Yiddish Wanderungen, right? So Yiddish wandering, right? Which is really mm -hmm. quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, Yiddish uh, Jewish statistics. Okay, if you ever wanted to see pie charts in in Yiddish, you know here they are, guys. Um, and you know, as a material object, right? It's so yeah. fascinating. It is so many things, right? It is a reflection yeah. of what you know an encyclopedia might have looked like in you know 1940 or whenever this was published. Oh. Um, it's it's what you know these imaginary like well if the Holocaust hadn't happened you know what would Yiddish culture look like what would Yiddish encyclopedias look like yeah um, my question to you is you know as you've spent obviously a lot of time with these volumes you know unlike a dictionary an encyclopedia kind of has an expiration date you know yeah. Yeah. so what kind of what how can we look toward these materials <laughs> what oh, use can we make of yeah. them today? So I, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this question, right? So, you know, when we think about the efforts to, you know, keep revitalizing Yiddish in an age where the number of native speakers, right, um, is so small in comparison to what existed before, you know, people have turned to, you know, Yiddish dictionaries, Yiddish grammars, um, to help with that project, and and but not the encyclopedia, right? And I was thinking like, why is that? But I think it, much of that has to do with the fact that it does have this expiration date to it, that the, the knowledge in it, especially in those early volumes is just antiquated, right? You know, you know the, the entries on x-rays aren't really gonna tell you very much uh, for today. Um, and actually at one point in the project, uh, an Israeli student who was interested in Yiddish, whose name I don't recall, wanted to use the Algamain Encyclopedia as the basis for a Yiddish Wikipedia. And I was like, don't do it. <laughs> like, it's not going to help. You know, if you want like an updated information, don't turn to a 1930s encyclopedia for it. But the, the value of this project, I think is actually immense. And really one of my key goals in writing this book is to bring this encyclopedia back into conversations because there's so many more books to be written about this project. Like, you know, linguists could look at it, philosophers can look at it. Um, you know, there, there's so many other pieces, you know, and my, my goal here was to tell like a, a, a central narrative, um, but there's so much more um, because it tells us what, what you know, the, this group of, of figures imagined was the essential information that needed to be preserved for the Jewish future. Because especially in those volumes after 1940, when they come to America, they, you know, they, they're, they're following news very, very closely. They're, they're following the news of the, the murder of their, 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 their comrades and their, their, you know, their, their colleagues in, in Europe. And they, they realize very, very quickly that they are the, the, the last of this cohort of intellectuals and that they have this duty and this obligation to put together the most essential information that they can to, to create a legacy for the post-war generation of American Jews who are likely not going to be working in the Yiddish language, but like how can they preserve what's fundamental? At the same time, they take on the, the tasks of trying to maintain networks, you know, of Yiddish speakers who are now scattered all over the globe, you know, largely in flight. So they want to use the encyclopedia as a way to maintain those the, the, these these connections with one or, with one another as Jews are moving further and further, you know, um, in exile from the you know the Eastern European center. Um, and so there's all these sort of goals to the project, which I think are worthwhile to understand. Um, if they're worthwhile also to honor, but also to assess critically, right, a as we've done. Um, and this is how it was received, you know, by a younger generation of Jews who were looking at these volumes and reviewing these volumes. They really said, like, 
this is helpful, this is not helpful, you know, like this is useful, th this is antiquated, <laughs> right? Because American Jews were not going to simply take on, you know, uh, sort of the, this, this mantle that was bestowed to them, but, and not define it for themselves, right? And, but, I, but what happened is that I think the encyclopedia gets left behind, but it's worthwhile to keep returning to. Yes, I, I highly agree with you. Um, my friend Elise here in the chat says, do you know if there have been any of these volumes used in undergraduate Jewish studies programs anywhere? It seems wild to me that they would not be. Um, I mean, I, I would be surprised because who knows, who, even in the Yiddish world, people don't know about them. Yeah, um, as far as I know, I'm the only scholar who's ever written on the encyclopedia other than people who've written reviews of volumes as they came out. So since the late 60s, um, I've looked in all of the databases I can find and I haven't found any other articles. There are some scholars who every now and then cite something in the encyclopedia, because especially those Yidin volumes and Jewish people past and present are just rich with information. So if you want to learn about, you know, what Jewish education looked like in the 1930s, you can find it there. If you want to learn about you know, the Jewish labor movement, you can find like amazing articles there. Um, and so people have cited those, but nobody's ever used this as a tool as far as I know. But if you look in, on, uh, in databases, you'll see that individual volumes are scattered around libraries all around the, the world, you know, and, and very much in, in America. Um, there's hardly any library though that has a full set. Right, which would make it less likely for somebody, for an educator to use it as a resource, yeah. um, even more unlikely. Yeah. Um, although, and I would add uh, to people who, ha who do find occasion to use the encyclopedia, for example, um, my friend William Pimlot, who I thought was gonna come, but I don't see him on the list here. And he writes on uh, the Yiddish press, the global Yiddish press. And he said, yeah, the, the article on the Yiddish press in the, in the encyclopedia is fantastic, so. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an interesting thing about it is that the, the entries that are in the, the first five volumes, I mean, they're just kind of, most of them are kind of boring, right? Because they're on like automotives and they're on, you know, steel production. And, but it's when they turn over to Jewish topics is when they're writing in the areas they actually know something about, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise they're mostly just, a lot of them are just copied from mm -hmm. other encyclopedias. I haven't done the work to compare like which ones come from the Britannica and the roots and, and others, but it's clear that they are, mm -hmm. you know, they're not original works, but as soon as they switch over, it, it takes on this dynamism, mm -hmm. you know, because they're really writing from their own experiences, their, you know, and their, their knowledge and it's, mm -hmm. and it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what would be like a dream project. I'm thinking like, what would be great, you know, and I think maybe this is you, you've already said this, but to do like um, a, a, an edited selection, you know, to really go through and find the best of them and have a bilingual, you know, edition. Yes, NEH, you know, I'm looking at you. Yeah. Are you listening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, Jordan asks here, have later reference works made use, oh, made use of the encyclopedia. I want to point something out, um, which is so weird, and Barry, um, you're the, you pointed this out to me, that um, the YIVO encyclopedia, which is now online and which is phenomenal, um, does not reference this encyclopedia. No, which Can began you... actually as a YIVO project. So this which I didn't mention, but the, uh, when it was initially designed in 1930, it was done by YIVO, you know, and YIVO housed it. Uh, and there were all these tensions between the Vilna group and the Berlin group. And eventually YIVO sort of disassociated from it and let the Dubno fund kind of go off on its own. So when the, the YIVO encyclopedia, encyclopedia came out, you know, I was very excited. And I looked for the entries on Algamay Encyclopedia and there was nothing. There are references to the encyclopedia because it's used in the bibliographies and every now and then there's a reference to it but there's no there was no awareness among the YIVO encyclopedias of the the 21st century that YIVO actually tried to create an encyclopedia in the you know early parts of the, the 20th century well I happen to know that YIVO is now in the process of doing um, some kind of uh, overhaul or revisions to their encyclopedia yes. So maybe we can, yeah. you know, do a little lobbying to make yes. sure that 
yeah. this encyclopedia gets an entry. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think that we should wrap it up here um, so that I know people have other places to go. We're competing against a number of events tonight, it turns out, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, but I do want to uh, encourage everyone again, if you stuck around, you're hardcore, you're really into reference books, get Barry's book. It's, it's really interesting. And it's such a fascinating group of people. And, you know, you follow them over so many years and, you know, the heartbreak and um, also, you know, the little triumphs. I mean, oh, yeah, I think it's a success story in many ways, because at any moment they could have just abandoned this project. But they Absolutely. stuck with it long after its uh, utility was clear, right? And so they left us this legacy that is just phenomenal and a, and a treasure. And, and really, really, it's a gift. I'm going to put, if it's okay with you, I'm going to put in the chat my email address. If anybody just has follow-up questions, like, you're welcome to email me. It may take me a few days um, to answer you, but I'll certainly write you back. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the word that you use in the book is resilience, like that it, it really, it's a story of resilience. And, and I think that's true. I mean, it can be both, it can be both, you know, a, a sad story and also a story of resilience. Um, so if people don't have any further questions, make sure you buy the book, you got the coupons, download the coupon, Rutgers University Press. Um, and I want to thank everybody for coming and Shane, Shane, you want to say good Goodbye, say our final word. Thank you, thank you. Uh, sure, um, Barry and Rochel, Rochel came, came up with the idea for this evening and uh, it's a really great, interesting and informative. Um, so thanks a bunch for coming up with the idea. Barry, thank you for joining us and for your work on, uh, on uh, the Algamena Encyclopedia. Thank you. I'm honored for to have had this opportunity. Thank you. And by the way, he is correct. If you go directly to Rutgers University Press and use the code oh. UPFIFTY, you'll get 50% off. Free shipping. Yeah. Almost to 30. I don't think they know that this code is still active. So make you And apparently they cover the shipping. They didn't charge they you. Do. And that's for all books covered that the press publishes, mind you. It's for everything at Rutgers right now. Are you P50? Yeah, secret 50% uh, off sale. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try RUP 60 next time. Oh. <laughs> um, well, they haven't existed for 60 years and they did it for their 50th anniversary. <laughs> but try it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you uh, so much. And thanks to the people who uh, joined us out there in Zoom land. Uh, this will go up uh, as well on uh, the internet. Although we'll cut out the 50%. Uh, <laughs> or don't. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. Good night. Everyone. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, and um, I guess we'll end it there.